All right. You ready, Nico? I'm ready. Okay, then let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to a new episode of 20 Minutes with Roy. This week we have uh, our oldest rider in the Wilter team. And now I'm happy to say that because uh, I've been that for years. <laughs> and um, this year the honor goes to Nicholas Rhodes. Welcome, Nico. Hey, Roy, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Before we start um, uh, doing the thing, I have to set the timer because uh, we want to keep it at exactly 20 minutes. So here we go. Um, Nico, how has it been going during the corona times with you? Well, uh, I guess it's, there's been ups and downs. Lots of uh, It's an adventure on its own, isn't it? It's something that's completely new for everybody. Uh, especially for us who were on full lockdown for, for 50, I think we were 57 days on full lockdown. So we weren't allowed to, to train outdoors. So uh, I spent quite some time on the, on the balcony <laughs> on the year ago. But uh, it was all about finding, you know, a new rhythm uh, and then just kind of trying to keep uh, as fit as possible, making it, finding a bit of a fun way to make it a little bit more interactive or else, you know, obviously if you're just there and pedaling without any reason it, it gets quite quite boring so you know with, with Mike and Matthews uh, and my brother we had a we we had our zoom conference every day uh, uh, while we were pedaling for a couple of hours and it re you know it, it was almost as good as riding together obviously uh, it's never the same but we're trying to kind of make things as dynamic as possible and and also a little bit more light and to be able to take it less seriously but still train properly so I think we managed pretty. I say we, as in with, with, with Michael as well. We we managed pretty well over the over those eight weeks. But uh, yeah, there were days where where things weren't easy. Yeah. For people who don't know, you uh, you live in Monaco, huh? Eh? I live in where, Monaco. Yeah. Uh, you've been uh, locked in for those uh, for all those days. Um, I think all the the people noticed that you. Um, yeah, found yourself uh, a new hobby uh, of riding on uh, online races, uh, which went quite well. Um, was that something that you uh, were been doing already before, or was it completely new? Completely new, completely new. But I have to say, uh, uh, the, the 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 first five weeks of lockdown, I was extremely happy to actually have that challenge. Uh, you know, the, the first few days uh, of the lockdown, I was, you know, started to think, you know, it was the first time something like this ever happened. Me being stuck alone in my apartment is like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to go crazy after five days. You know, there's, there's only so much TV I can watch. I'm not used to that. Uh, I'm always on an airplane or on a bike or doing something. There's just always something going on. Uh, and I was like, oh, how am I going to manage? You know, in, in my life, I had never done an hour and a half on the ergo. It was just like, something that was just not for me. <laughs> now I even done, you know, I even done a six hour ride on the Ergo, so it's, uh, I've, I've opened new horizons. But uh, basically when the team said um, that uh, they wanted me to do the, uh, the Tour Flanders, I said, okay, sure, why not? So I took it pretty seriously. I, I was already in, in really good shape. I was preparing for, uh, I was about to ride Catalonia, but I was preparing for, for Pay Basque and the Classic. So I was, uh, I was already in really good condition. And, um, I said, wow, it's stupid to throw it away. At least I have this race to do. And then obviously when I saw the statistics or the, for the bookies and I was like last by one to 26, I was saying, hey guys, this is not Flanders. This is a 45 minute full gas race. I'm not gonna lose this thing. I don't care if they're world champions, Olympic champions or Roubaix winners or Flanders winners. This is not Flanders. There's no cobbles, there's no positioning, there's not 245K. This is gonna be about stamina and wanting it. And uh, I, I said, I take this seriously. So I did a bit of training towards it during the week. Uh, I did an online race on a, on a different platform uh, just to get the feel of it. But I mean, the, the first few days that I was on it and I, I, I trained uh, on those kind of e-races, my legs just completely exploded. And I straight away thought, all right, this is something that's gonna need training. You cannot just go from the road bike jump on the ergo and then do a race. You, there's so much muscle adaptation. It's like if you go on the first time in your life for a TT bike and you start, you know, at the start of the year when you do your first TT bike, you would understand that. Next thing, all your legs, just you feel all the pain on, on your ass muscles, on your quads, just because the position is different. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a little bit similar because I found myself that on the, on, when I was doing these efforts on the ergo, you, you move forward a little bit because you're always kind of pulling. So mm -hmm. I had to adjust the, move with the bike. Yeah. Exactly. So I also yeah. had to adjust a little bit the tip of the saddle because obviously 
you, you need more stability and because you're pushing forward your position your setback is changing a little bit and i didn't want to change the whole saddle position but i did kind of get that i needed to put the saddle a little bit more up just to be a little bit more stable and also realized that i was putting a lot more pressure on my quads so by by going forward so it's going to take a few days of really hard uh, efforts before my legs get used to it and uh so i did <laughs> i kind of challenged myself on a few of those online races before uh that that flanders event and then flanders went well and i was quite happy i think uh, i did a really really good effort and um and then the team said a couple of days later that there will be the online race of uh tour de suisse and i might be doing three out of the five races i said yeah sure this is going to be great and i really committed to it um for those three weeks that i had to prepare in between flanders and, and the online swiss mm. uh, i did a lot of the races maybe once maybe twice a week some of the weeks to get ready for it uh also did you know the proper recons in the morning just to make sure about uh what type of uh gear and, and also the change of cadence because when you were using swift it was very different than uh be be to uh, be cool and then be cool was different than ruby every time you have a change of a uh, of um of like the, of exactly of the gradient uh the way that it react on you and i mean it really kills your leg if you're not used to it so obviously the guys are saying oh yeah it, it, um uh, what you call it you know if you didn't train for it it was already a massive disadvantage it doesn't matter how strong you were if your muscles were not ready to go from 60 cadence to 120 cadence to 60 cadence in less than one minute you were not used to it you, you had to you had to train it so i said i'm gonna commit it was really important for me because uh the team has been great the team has backed us up all the way since uh since this lockdown and for me it was a way of saying thank you for the team for the investment that they're putting with us so it was very important to, to be competitive and I think it was really good because uh, the, the five or six of us who did these events all took it seriously. We all uh, did pretty well in those, uh, in those races and uh, you know, uh, you, you saw some of the risers and when they were doing the race or you know, giving a wave, doing the hearts or changing Netflix channels not to give a few names. So obviously they were not going to win it. But I think yeah. everyone in the team, if you, if you look at the videos from Michael, Chris, uh, myself, because those are the ones that I saw actually on, on video. We're not playing around. We're we're giving it socks, and yeah. and, and it was about committing to it. And, and I took it seriously. I trained for it, and I think that was a that was a good a good thing. And that that type of effort is good for me because it's it's a lot about stamina and ego and not giving up. You know, there's no glory in an e race. There's no glory on, or fans or world two points or millions of euro contracts at the end of it. Okay. This is purely about the one that's going to go the deepest, just for the sake of going deep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, it was all about uh, not letting go and and the fact that you, you had like this uh, the, the avatars of the others also gave you more stamina because you're actually not fighting only against yourself. You're fighting against somebody else who's riding away from you. So it's like when you're trying to close a, uh, when you're trying to close a gap on a breakaway when you're chasing. It's the same kind of effect where you push yourself so deep just to get back on the wheel. Where you, you can't do that if you're attacking on your own, for example. But to close the gap, somehow you're able to, to go that bit deeper. So that was a little bit the feeling that you get in these races. Is when the gap is opening, you realize that you need to push more. And it's not. that's why when people are saying, oh, it's like a TT. Not really. Because on a TT, you, you kind of decide what you want to do. Where yeah. there, you also have to do what the others are doing. Uh, and it's not good enough to say, oh, I'm going to do 400 watts and put your heads down and look down yeah. because it doesn't work that way. Uh, yeah. Because like I said, one, it, it, it's not a very, very stable effort because because of the, the what you call it, the, the, the break and, and, and the resistance, it, you, you don't always decide the same pace that you cannot ride smooth like in time trial. It's just about mm -hmm. always riding to your limit, to, to the gradient, but also depending on the other guys. So it's, it's very different, actually. It's a completely different sport. Uh, and like everything, if you didn't train it, uh, you cannot just go from training on the road to, to being uh, super... Yeah, yeah you, have to, you have to practice it. Uh, yeah. And I think this is also one of the advantages that we, we had uh, from, from being... You know, I didn't, I didn't go on the road for, for yeah, 57 days. I did 57 days of, uh, of ergo. So obviously there was not going on the road, coming back on the, on yeah, the, the, on the road. Bodies, right? Exactly. Yeah. It was just like full, 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 full. Actually, when I got back to the road, it was strange because the bike was moving. I was like, whoa, what, what's happening, you know? I think in the end, uh, respect, Nico, that you can, um, at this point of your career, just get so motivated for something like this. <laughs> uh, I think that must be real passion for the sports, no? 
Yeah, totally. Uh, that's what I was saying. Like people were saying, "Oh, you like esports?" Says, "No, not really." But uh, it, it was just it was a new challenge, and I was also kind of happy, you know. But if, if you told me 16 years ago when I turned pro, I was gonna be part of an official e race, I would not have believed you. It was already hard for me to think I was going to use a DI2 one day. I thought it was, you know. So I've gone from discovering power meters to DI2 uh, to switching from aluminium to carbon bikes and now even e-races. And I said, this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. <laughs> yeah, nice to see. Nice to see. But doesn't that leave you with a, yeah, with a what if in, the, in mind? If you, um, yeah, you obviously said, uh, I felt I was ready for... Uh, for Basco the classics. Um, yeah, I also know a bit that um, the build up towards this year uh, has been uh, way more smooth than uh, the past uh, two years yeah. for you. Um, so, yeah, I, I can imagine it also yeah, gives you a little bit in the back of your head the thought, yeah, what if there were races? How, uh, how do you cope with that? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I had a really good winter. The camps with the team went really well. And then um, went out with Michael in South Africa to kind of finish off the preparation in, in February. So I committed yeah. a lot, you know, out of the, 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 the first uh, seven weeks of the year, I was gone six. <laughs> so uh, I really, really committed to, to this season. Um, and then the first race wasn't too bad. I was seventh in GC. So I was really progressing in, in the right direction. Everything went well. The race program was, was, was really good for me. And then obviously, yeah, uh, everything's canceled and I'm stuck in an apartment doing e-races. So um, at the beginning it was quite hard and you know, it was like all this for nothing. And then at the end it's like, no, it's never really for nothing. Because you remember at the start of this quarantine, we didn't know if the tour was gonna happen in July, August, September, or keep the dates. Now it's easy to say, oh yeah, now maybe it was for nothing. But back in March, it was maybe going to be postponed one week, two weeks. They were talking of doing it the first week of July instead of uh, the last week of June and, and all that. So at that moment, it was like, all right, I'm still, pro I'm still on time for my Tour de France preparation. And this is also why I was doing 20 hours a week on the Ergo, because I was looking on the, at my TSS and training load from last year, trying to replicate as much as I could the same workloads to arrive more or less in the same condition when the quarantine was over and initially it was two weeks <laughs> and then it went to four and then it went to eight but at yeah. the beginning they said oh yeah two weeks <laughs> it's like ah oh, two weeks that's all right i'll do that but um so at the beginning it was like all right i just need to keep on the same workload because what i do now i don't need to do it later so <laughs> now obviously with the tour being in in or the first race has been in august um it, it, it's I think that the work I did now will be useful for August anyway. So I don't mm. regret the work. What's a pity is for once in, in, in a couple of years, I was in really good shape in April and I didn't have a race to prove it. Uh, so th that I, I mean a real race to prove it. So that, mm. I, that I'm a little bit disappointed. But I think yet again, if you look at how, how important these e-races e got in, in the media and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the numbers are there. So everybody sees that I was capable of doing for the four races more or less, I did exactly more or less the same watts so or whatever, 425 or something like that for almost yeah. an hour. So the proof of my fitness is there. The only problem is, is I'm getting e-results and not real results. But, yeah. um, but anyway, like I said, uh, for me, it was important to, to keep everything in mind and to keep the workload towards the end of the year because every year I'm pretty good in shape in August, September, and I wanted to be in yeah. the same, replicate the same workload to arrive in the same sh condition or better at uh, a couple of months time. Yeah. Period. Yeah, sounds logic. Um, last week we had uh, Case Ball in the show, yeah. and um, he had a question for you. He was actually curious what your first ride outside after the lockdown was, and yeah, where did you go? What was the training like? So I had uh, I had two two um, two one the official Monaco one because you know Monaco Monaco opened one week before France. Yeah. But um, I, I actually did, uh, just because my brother lives in France and he was training with me for, for seven weeks, I wasn't going to abandon him. So I said, I can do one more week on the Ergo. I did seven weeks, I can do eight. So I thought I'd be, uh, I, I'd, I'd stay with my brother and make sure that he's, you know, he, he was there to help me. He's not professional. He didn't have to go every day with me, but he was really important with my motivation. And, and the same was Michael. So I said, mm -hmm. I'm, keeping, I'm keeping that one week Ergo with him. Also, to go in circles in Monaco wasn't really my thing. 
So um, I did do one day, uh, one hour around Monaco, and uh, I, I had a friend that says, now it's time for Strava. <laughs> so uh, there was this climb up the casino, and I said, all right, I, I don't care if I'm going to die on top, but I'm going for the Strava, and I'm going to make sure it stays there now, because, you know, next time the guy needs to get up at five o'clock in the morning if he wants to beat me. So yeah. uh, I took a challenge. I said, all right, I'm going to sprint up the casino climb and get Strava, and I did, so I was quite happy. Uh, <laughs> so that was my first kind of official Monaco uh, ride. And then on the Monday, um, the same, a little bit the same. So there was a Ford guy with us on our group with, uh, with Michael and my brother, a guy called Laurent, who's a friend of us from, from just, well, he lives just outside Monaco, but on the French side. And mm -hmm. um, his uh, wife was expecting a baby all, all, all week. So once again, I said, all right, um, let, let's stick around. So we did Caldez and, and Top of the Madon and, and that area. So I only, we only got like three or four hours. We didn't go too far. We did loops around Monaco, but uh, we still got like almost 3,000 meters of climbing, I think. So it was, uh, it was more than enough, but, uh, oh, but it, it was great. The only thing it was the bike just felt like at least 40 minutes. I, I just could not recognize my bike. I didn't know if the bike was broken or if my legs were broken or it was just like, oh, wh what's happening, you know? Is but this, uh, it, it was really fun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. That's a uh, yeah, completely new uh, new uh, trigger for your body then at the moment. Huh? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible how your brain works. Uh, yeah. how, and how also, how quickly actually it adapts then. Huh? Yeah, because like I said... When you an hour on the bike, then you are back again. Back again, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's also funny to, uh, to uh, notice. Um, I think enough about cycling, uh, Nico. Um, other things. Uh, I know you like motorbikes. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Was there already time for the, doing that? Uh, did you miss that during the lockdown? Was afterwards uh, time to uh, to pick that up again? Yeah, it was. Uh, I didn't go too far. I only did one one little drive, but uh, just to take it out. Like I, <laughs> you know, I just needed to go to the post office, and I said, oh, I'm just going to take it out and get it clean, put petrol in it, and it was just uh, it was just nice to just. A bit like on your bike, you know, sometimes it's not about how long you do. It's just the fact of going on it and, and just taking it out for a drive and feel happy and parking it again. Um, yeah. My motorbike is a, is a collector's model, so I don't drive it too much. I usually take it just once a month just to kind of just to open up and do a little loop and then I go back. And it's like the type of motorbike where I almost have more fun just looking at it than, than actually driving it. But, uh, what bike is it then? So it's an MV Agusta RS V1. There's only 100 made. But I'm the only one. There's actually only two in uh, in France and Monaco, so it's not a very popular bike. But uh, um, just because they're they're they're, they're rare, uh, I kind of want to keep the mileage low and keep it a little special. So it's like when I when I want to kind of escape, I just go and I just go up to La Turbie or Caldez and just take a few pictures of it and <laughs> drive back down. And I drive it like an hour or or sometimes you know I drive down to Antibes where my parents live. Uh, mm -hmm. to go and see them because it's just easier for car for, for parking but it, it's the problem is because it's kind of rare I can't just park it and leave it on the footpath I always have to make sure it's in a nice car park place so it's almost more trouble than anything else so when I take it is just to, to go for a drive basically and, and not park it <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice it was just so nice just to, to wear the helmet and and just go for a little drive it, it was it was cool I can imagine that uh, that also are uh, things that you feel uh, connected to freedom yeah, again exactly. after uh, after being in lockdown. I think. Yeah. 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 Hey, and um, everybody who uh, who sees you sees obviously your tattoos. Um, Which ones? All one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not all. Uh, but um, are there with special uh, reasons uh, tattoos, or uh, is it just a hobby? Uh, th don't ask me why. I, I did one because I always wanted one when I was 18. And I said, all right, that's it, never again. And then the year after, I did another one. And then I said, all right, that's it, never again. And then the year after, I did another one. And then some years, I did three or four. And then I did two or three years without them. It's kind of, um, I know it's wrong, but it's always been very impulsive. It's more like, oh, I want to get this tattooed. And I get a meeting, and then next week, the week after or a month later, depending on the, the schedule. I I get a tattoo. So at the moment, I've, I've properly calmed down. It's two years since I didn't get uh, another tattoo. I think for the moment, I've uh, my impulses <laughs> have diminished. <laughs> but some have more meaning than others. Um, for example, the, 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 this, this one, which is the, the bigger one. 
um, mm -hmm. that I, I, when I was in, in Bora Bora, um, obviously one of my kind of dreams as a tattoo fan was to get a tattoo by a typical Bora Bora Polynesian tattooist. And um, so I started there, but obviously uh, the tattoo was so big that uh, he gave me uh, he gave me some some notes. So he didn't draw it, he didn't uh, tattoo it. He just put a few notes and a few symbols. And then when I got mm -hmm. here, we uh, with the tattoo guy here, we we looked up on internet and he replicated some of the symbols. Because um, this one was cool. Like we, he didn't um, he was doing it as we were talking. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my, my, you know, the base was the turtle, and I got the turtle because it meant, you know, power. It was the. Oh, the are over, Nico. Ah. They're already there. Oh, she did it. Okay. Sorry about that. Talk too much. No, that's uh, <laughs> that's the concept, that. Thanks, Roy. Next week we're gonna have uh, Julia Souk from the ladies team in the in the twenty minutes. Do you have a special question for her? Yeah. So don't I don't uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think her family and her work in the restaurant. Is that correct? Or they have a restaurant? Yeah. So I'd like to know if uh, during her lockdown she was practicing her cooking or training. <laughs> oh, one more. Okay, that's a nice question. Um, if you are interested to see the answer, then look next week. I look in. Yeah, great. Good talking to you. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye.